Hello and welcome to this lecture, Framework for Ethical Reasoning, Using Ethical Principles to Solve Practical Problems. This lecture roughly follows Rosen's Chapter 9. Now that we have a sense of the four ethical principles that professionals and public servants should use when trying to decide what's right to do or what decision is the best decision to make for and with their clients or for and with the public, we can examine several ways in which we can use those principles to actually undertake that reasoning. Now, using principles to frame our ethical decision making has some benefits, and primarily those benefits are ones that apply to not just the professional or public servant making the decisions and his or her clients, but to everyone who is a professional or public servant and to everyone who uses professionals and public servants to help them in whatever situation they need help resolving. Now some of these benefits are that um, using principles allows us to take account of the effects of our decisions on our clients and on the public. Also using principles to guide our decision making reminds everyone of the basic ethical considerations at issue like seeking best results, being fair, respecting autonomy, and so forth. Also, what this does is allows us to clarify possible sources of confusion or uncertainty in particular circumstances. When we lay those principles out clearly, then uh, the decision pathway should be clarified. Using principles to guide our decision making also facilitates the anticipation of possible ethical objections so that we're aware of when others might object to what we're doing or raise concerns that what we need to do is provide additional justification. Using principles also indicates when decisions risk deviating from other ethical requirements. And doing so reminds professionals that personal values are an inappropriate basis for decision making. Ethical principles, thereby, provide reasons for taking one course of action over another, adopting one policy position versus another, making one decision instead of another decision. And so what we find is that principles provide reasons when those principles are relevant to the situation. That is, they provide reasons for acting one way or another, adopting one policy or another, or so forth. Principles also provide reasons which hold over relevantly similar conditions and circumstances. So if we treat one client in this way in this situation using these principles, then we should expect and our client should expect that we treat a similarly situated client in a similar situation using similar pr principles in the same way. Principles can also provide reasons for failing to act on other relevant principles. So there may be times when uh, ethical principles conflict and uh, we might have to make a decision about which principle to follow or which principle to employ and that principle can help us provide reasons um, for why we didn't use the other principle. Principles also provide consistency to our actions. That is when we have relevantly similar facts and we employ the same principle, we should arrive at the same decision or the same course of action. When we have relevantly different facts of the matter and it, or employ a different principle, then we should expect to come to different conclusions about what the right course of action is. Here are some examples to consider. When asked why he gave his sister a speeding ticket, Officer Jim said, because everyone who is speeding, like she was, deserves a ticket. And in this example, the officer is applying the same principle to the same 
or similarly situated individuals, those who are all speeding like his sister was, and the course of action is the correct one for her as it would be the correct one for anyone else in her situation. So the fact of her being his sister is not uh, relevant given the principle. Another example, when asked why she voted in support of the 10% county budget reduction, Council Member Sandy replied, because it's fairer to ask every department to share the burden of the deficit. In this way, appealing to the principle to treat people fairly and justly uh, applies to uh, the Council Member's decision making such that she votes in favor of a policy that treats everyone the same, and in this way the principle requiring her to treat everyone the same who's similarly situated is applied and provides reason for her vote. Another example when Tom asks Mary why she failed to meet him for coffee as she promised, Mary replied, I would have kept my promise but as I was walking over I saw a child drowning in a pool and stopped to give aid. So here the existence of a promise provides a reason to act in one way, that is to meet Tom for coffee but also uh, another duty, another principle at play, that is a principle to render aid when possible, um, was relevant to the situation and led Mary to decide the right course of action was to stop and help save the drowning child. And so that principle overrides the principle um, involved with keeping promises. But notice that it doesn't make the promise go away because of course she has to justify her failure to keep her promise to Tom and referring to the principle to render aid helps her in providing reasons that Tom should also accept for why she failed to keep her promise to him. And if Tom is reasonable and ethical he will accept that reason uh, and they can have coffee when they're both able. All right, let's take a look at practical syllogisms because using practical syllogisms is one way that we can apply principles to circumstances and to derive with the intention of deriving um, some guidance for our actions. Now in ethics what we do is we focus on practical syllogisms since what we're after is guidance for action that is guidance in real actual situations practice relevant um, guidance. So let's take a look first at what a syllogism is. A syllogism is a simplified form of an argument that is we take what would otherwise be an argument articulated over paragraphs if it, it were a letter or a blog post or um, minutes of conversation if it were something that uh, people were offering each other face to face and a syllogism takes is, is the result of taking that complex argument and distilling it down into its uh, most basic elements. So a syllogism is a simplified form of an argument in which we stipulate premises and these premises are relevant to the situation and uh, we also stipulate the conclusion that is to be drawn from these premises and the conclusion is also itself clearly stipulated and the implication from the premises to the conclusion is clear and so the, the idea of writing an argument in the form of a syllogism allows the uh, the other person or, or whoever's looking at the argument or considering the argument to see the clear connection between the reasons articulated in the premises and the conclusion that is the decision or choice or course of action one follows. Now with a syllogism that inference that connection between the premises and the conclusion is a strong one so that if one accepts the premises that if that is if one accepts the reasons that are given then one then has to accept the conclusion and one has to by force of reason. If the premises are clearly relevant to the situation and they lead by inference um, or by logical processes, deduction perhaps, um, to the conclusion then to deny the conclusion would lead us to raise questions about the rationality of the person who denies the conclusions. It would just not seem sensible or logical to deny the conclusion and so a good syllogism that is a syllogism that is well structured uh, contains the force of reason that leads the person from the premises to the conclusion. Now practical syllogism is practical because the conclusion is a normative prescription which guides individual action either generally or in particular cases.
and the syllogism as a practical syllogism reveals the reasons for those actions or the decision that's taken and the relation to the circumstances of the situation so what it does is it structures the reasons for action which are articulated in the premise and the course of action which is articulated in the conclusion and the conclusion would then also be um, guidance for action so a practical syllogism contains a general principle that is a general ethical principle and some set of facts of the matter and those facts of the matter might include definitions and together the general principle with the facts of the matter provide the reasons for action which are stipulated in the conclusion principles provide reasons for action under a certain set of facts okay so that's what the syllogism provides it articulates the relevant principle and the facts of the matter under which that principle is applied and the result of the, sy the syllogism is an action guiding prescription for how to act or for what course uh, of, or procedure to undertake or for what decision to make under the conditions specified in the premise. This normative guidance applies also universally under similar circumstances since what we are after is an ethical conclusion and so as an ethical conclusion even though it might be articulated in the form of I should or I must or I have an obligation to or I ought to as though the conclusion applies only to the individual making the argument we have to understand if this is an ethical argument that's being offered that I really means anyone or everyone so anytime a practical syllogism ends in I should or I ought to it can be inferred that if I ought to do it it must be the case that everyone ought to do it or that anyone similarly situated to whoever the I refers to should do similarly for example, we can have a premise uh, for a syllogism such as promises should be kept and this premise articulates a general principle about promise keeping. We can add to it premise 2, I promised to meet Tom for coffee. This is a statement of fact. It's a fact of the matter whether I promised to meet Tom or not for coffee. And so premise 2 articulates the facts of the matter. That is that there exists a promise which I made to Tom and it's about uh, meeting him for coffee. Now from these two premises, premise 1 and premise 2, we can draw implications. That is we can infer, and if I were articulating this um, argument to you in conversation you would already be thinking um, that well the conclusion is that I should meet Tom for coffee right uh, and the conclusion is that I should meet Tom for coffee and that conclusion articulates some practical guidance or a prescription for what I should do so if here I am sitting wondering wow um, what should I do this afternoon well I promised to meet Tom for coffee that's a statement of fact and I think through relevant ethical principles and I discern that there is one which applies and that is that promises should be kept and I combine the two to reach the conclusion that I should meet Tom for coffee and so that then guides my action for what I should do this afternoon if I deviate from that that is if I do something other than meet Tom for coffee this afternoon then I would need to justify that not only to myself but to Tom because Tom is a relevant participant in the matter and so I would need to provide some sort of justification as to why I did not do what I should do which is that I should have met him for coffee another example we can articulate a premise a person ought to seek the best results and that's an articulation of a general ethical principle combine that with a set of facts and articulate those facts in premise 2 arresting this drunk woman lets me take her to county jail for the night which will be better than leaving her on the street vulnerable with nowhere to go and no money these are all statements of fact and the conclusion is then that I ought to arrest this woman so the conclusion provides prescription practical guidance for me regarding what I should do now of course this example assumes that I have arresting authority which I would if I were a police officer and so the I ought applies also to others similarly situated so others who have arresting power and so really this could read anyone ought to arrest a woman like this when 
in similar situations. That is, she's drunk, there's available a spot in county jail, um, and spending the night in county jail would be better than leaving her on the street where she's vulnerable, where she has nowhere to go, where she has no money. All of these are stipulations of fact, and so anyone ought to reach the same conclusion when applying the principle that one ought to seek the best results. Now, other than using principles together with practical syllogisms to guide our reasoning, we should talk about something called practical wisdom. Now, practical wisdom pertains to something we covered earlier in the semester under the distinction between rules and principles. So if you recall way back to when we were first talking about ethical principles, um, we talked about judgment. And we talked about the importance of exercising judgment with regard to principles and that that's a better approach to ethics for professionals and public servants than merely articulating a series of rules and expecting professionals and public servants to just comply with rules. Now practical wisdom was mentioned in conjunction with judgment way way back then and this is also relevant if you recall earlier in the semester talking about one of the things that uh, is a fundamental element of professionals and public servants is that they have a level of authority and within that authority is the power of discretion that is that they have discretion over how they exercise their knowledge and their expertise and their experience and in service of which ends what clients and what public good so with discretion, to make discretion ethical, we need to combine that with ethical judgment. And so practical wisdom is really crucial for professionals to grasp and to start practicing. So whenever we have areas of discretion in law enforcement, in medical care and treatment, in education, in so many areas of professional life, professionals and public servants really do have to practice practical wisdom. So in addition to syllogisms, practical syllogisms, we need to talk about how principles can facilitate and support decision making that is more along the lines of practical wisdom. So practical wisdom differs from the results of a practical syllogism because generally the conclusions of practical wisdom are more subtle and more contextual and uh, offer um, a distinctive response to a particular situation. It allows for the interpretation of relevant principles. Interpretation will be important in a moment, but often principles have to be interpreted against the facts of the matter in order to discern what the right action is. And so practical wisdom embraces this interpretation uh, element of um, using ethical principles. Practical wisdom also recognizes complexity in everyday moral situations. Not everything is black and white, as the saying goes. There is often, in ethical matters and moral matters, uh, a large area of gray. And in that large area of gray, there is room for deciding in many different directions or deciding uh, many different courses of action. And so recognizing this complexity is a fundamental element of practical wisdom. And the conclusions of our exercise of practical wisdom are not forced by reason. That is, to disagree with someone's conclusion uh, drawn from practical wisdom is not necessarily to indicate that a person has some uh, failure to be reasonable or is being irrational in some way, um, or that something's blocking their ability to rationally grasp what's at issue. And so the conclusion not being forced by reason um, because reasonable people can disagree about what a principle requires or how to balance conflicting principles is one of the advantages of practical wisdom. And it's an important element, as I said uh, previously, of professional judgment and discretion. Practical wisdom also requires, therefore, the application of experience to reasoning about moral situations. Past experience is crucial and so practical wisdom is more and more what a seasoned professional, a seasoned public servant can come to rely on as they gain that experience and that familiarity and as they practice uh, employing ethical principles to the various circumstances in which they find themselves.
So past experience applying a particular principle in a certain situation may lead to um, problematic conclusions or may lead in some instances to a decision that wasn't the best decision and so exercising practical wisdom allows us then to modify when that principle is applied and what are relevantly similar situations in which that principle can apply. So there's that flexibility and interpretive element that comes in. It requires also close attention to integrity. That is, practical wisdom is really not going to work without um, a person of character, a person of integrity. It also requires close attention to morally relevant facts. The failure to note a relevant fact or the omission of some relevant facts in one's decision making employing practical wisdom can make a significant uh, impact on the decision that's made. So we have to be very attentive to what the facts are in their detail and in their particularity to the case at hand. It also requires close attention to balancing conflicting and competing principles. And we'll talk about balancing conflicting and competing principles in a moment. And it also requires recognition that one might be mistaken about what the right course of action is, or whether mistaken or not, that one might be criticized by those, even other colleagues, who employ a different balancing of principles or a different interpretation of principles. All right, let's take a look at ethical dilemmas because ethical dilemmas, even though people use the term dilemma to characterize a difficult situation, is not merely a difficult situation. When we use the term dilemma precisely, uh, at least in the philosophical context, what we're talking about is a situation in which ethical principles collide or conflict. So a dilemma, a true dilemma, is a situation, a case, a circumstance in which there are two principles let's say principle X, generic principle X, which directs us to do A, some action A, and that conflicts with another principle, principle Y, for example, which requires another course of action, action B, where principles X and Y are both relevant to the situation and one cannot do both A and B. So when we have a true dilemma, what we have is a case of conflicting principles. For example, you might have a situation in which you consider whistleblowing. You have a principle requiring you to seek the best results. You have a situation where the facts of the matter are that certain people in a very important public agency engaged in wrongdoing, which uh, risks the well-being of the public, but you also have another conflicting principle at play, a principle of confidentiality, which requires you not to disclose information um, to the public or to those outside of the agency. And so in this sort of situation, you have a true dilemma. You have two principles, the principle to seek the best results and minimize risk of harm to the public, conflicting with the principle of integrity, which requires us to provide confidentiality to our clients and to our colleagues, and they collide. They direct us to engage in actions to disclose the wrongdoing in the case of seeking the best results, and in the case of the principle of uh, uh, requiring us to act with integrity, which directs us toward confidentiality, the course of action there is to not disclose. So you've got a true ethical dilemma in a case of whistleblowing. Now the decision is how do we resolve those conflicting principles so that we can find what the right course of action to do is and to do it. Ethical dilemmas feel irresolvable but only if we view ethical principles as absolute. That is that we have an absolute responsibility to follow one principle and an absolute undeniable responsibility to follow the other principle. But we cannot follow them both because they lead us in conflicting directions, conflicting courses of action. So it feels irresolvable when principles are viewed in this sort of absolutist way as applying always and only um, and when they're conflicting then we can't we can't act we feel paralyzed there are however some reasons to view ethical principles not as absolute but as uh, interpretable flexible that is uh, resolvable balanceable and so forth now for professionals 
there are reasons to view principles um, not as absolute because professionals have an obligation to do something to move the situation forward. It's not acceptable for a professional to whom a client has come for assistance says, well, you know, we've got these two conflicting principles. I don't know how to resolve them. Uh, no course of action is better than any other course of action, so I don't know what to prescribe to you. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, have a nice day. Um, a professional has an obligation to do something, so it must be the case that some balance can be found between principles. And if believing those ethical principles to be absolute impedes the finding of some balance or some compromise, then we have to reconsider that view of principles as absolute. There's also a conceptual reason, that is, ethics cannot require what is impossible. If ethical action entails unethical action, that is, if following one principle leads to what is considered unethical according to another principle, then we have a conceptual problem. We have an ethical requirement that leads to an unethical conclusion, and that's not acceptable within ethics. This is often referred to as the imperative that ought implies can. That is, if it's ever possible to articulate an ought, it must be the case that that ought can be achieved, can be satisfied. All right, so how do we address dilemmas? Well, we can adopt three strategies um, that are relevant to working through dilemmas. First, we can interpret the principles, and we've mentioned this briefly earlier. By interpreting principles, what we do is we formulate the expectations that professionals use their expertise and their experience to interpret principles to minimi minimize dilemmas. We take a look at principles in their generality, and we see that in that generality there is flexibility. So how a particular principle articulated in a general form, like seeking the best results, applies in a particular situation requires interpretation by the professional or the public servant who is seeking to uh, employ that principle. Interpretation can enable greater, compa greater compatibility between otherwise conflicting principles so that when we take a look at ethical principles as flexible, as requiring interpretation, what a particular principle requires in a particular situation may be slightly different from what that same principle requires applied in a different situation under a different set of facts. Now sometimes interpretation doesn't work uh, in the way that we hope, or perhaps some interpretations are just uh, require too much flexibility on the part of the principle to the point where we might no longer recognize the principle. And so we, we set interpretation aside and we might then seek a compromise. Now I know in today's parlance compromise is uh, often thought by some to be a bad word, but compromise really is a way for us to find a middle path or a ground, uh, a pathway, a decision, um, a course of action that satisfies as many of the conflicting principles as much as possible. So it might be the case that not every principle in the conflict is satisfied to its fullest extent, but if we can find a course of action which mostly satisfies each of the principles involved, then we have a possible compromise which might, in the circumstance, be the best ethically that can be achieved. But to seek a compromise, we have to accept that not all conflicting principles will be completely satisfied. And we also have to um, understand that professionals will use their expertise and their experience to identify courses of action which offer a best compromise. So there may be various compromises possible, but of course the idea is to find that which is most ethically defensible, the best compromise. But what do we do when these two strategies don't provide us a way forward. Well, we have a third strategy, and that is to prioritize the principles involved in the conflict. So we only uh, resort to this third um, approach, the prioritizing of principles, when there's no alternative method available for solving the dilemma. So when the first two, interpreting or compromise, don't lead us to a way forward to solve the problem. So then we might uh, pursue the, the 
step of prioritizing principles. So the idea here is that with those four principles in play, professionals have an obligation to ensure that all four of them are satisfied in any given case. Now most of the time those principles will reinforce each other, that is they will point to the same course of action. If we looked at each principle separately, they would point to the same course of action and so in that course of action we can satisfy the requirements of all the principles um, involved. Now sometimes that's not possible. We can interpret them, see if there's an interpretation problem, see if there's a compromise problem, perhaps not all of the principles can be satisfied fully, and if neither of those two strategies work then we can resort to prioritizing the principles. Maybe seeking the best results is more important than treating people fairly or or respecting autonomy, and perhaps integrity is more important than seeking the best results. Perhaps in another situation autonomy is prioritized over seeking the best results or over um, treating people fairly and so forth. Prioritizing principles assumes that what ethical principles do is impose prima facie duties. Prima facie is a Latin term and it means on the face of it. And so what I mean when I say that uh, all principles impose prima facie duties is to say on first glance on the face of it all things considered equal the principle says this is what we ought to do. Now exercising experience, attending to the particular circumstances and facts of a case might allow us to say look in this case sure there's a prima facie duty to do such and so but given the circumstances this other duty which also is a prima facie duty is the duty that's more important and so we ought to do this duty instead of the other so if we go back to an example from earlier in this lecture um, my meeting Tom for coffee, I promised that is a principle um, that r tells me I should, all things equal, keep the promise, and so all things considered equally, I should meet Tom for coffee, but here I am on my way to coffee and I see a child drowning in the pool, there's another principle at issue, I ought to render aid when possible, I can swim, Right. I'm here, the child's not drowned yet, it's possible for me to render aid, and so I should follow that principle. Both keeping promises and rendering aid employ prima facie duties, but I cannot satisfy both principles without grave circumstances resulting in either direction, none of which are ethically acceptable, and so the only course of action that I have is to recognize that each of these principles employs a prima facie duty, but in this circumstance I have elevated the principle of rendering aid above, I've prioritized it above the principle um, that I should keep my promises, and so I render aid, I help to save the drowning child, but I fail to meet Tom for coffee. That doesn't make my duty to see Tom for coffee disappear. It's still a prima facie duty. It's still a duty I have and at the very least I owe Tom an explanation and an accounting of my reasoning about how it is that I prioritized the principles uh, and came to the conclusion that the right thing to do was to render aid to the drowning child. Prima facie principles obligate us only conditionally and so what we have to do is exercise our practical wisdom to find under what conditions the obligations hold and under what conditions they don't and uh, hopefully that can help guide us through the decision making in the way that I just gave uh, an example of. The prioritizing of principles relies upon professional judgment to assess the relative importance of each principle involved in a particular situation. Now that judgment has to be based on certain things. It has to be based on knowledge of the details of the situation. It has to be based on experience with similar situations and the application of relevant principles to the facts at hand. And we have to be attentive to the fact that this is not an anything goes. It's not just that uh, I don't feel like following one principle or another. Oh gosh, it's really inconvenient for me to follow this principle instead of that principle. 
we have to be able to minimize the violation of other relevant principles even after the dilemma is resolved. We have to seek to maintain consistency in our decision making and in our action across similar situations. And we have to be able to justify to our clients, to the public, to our colleagues, the prioritization of the principles which we adopted. All right, so appraising situations in which we might find ourselves in a true dilemma. First, ascertain whether any legal or regulatory prescriptions apply. These take priority. Remember, throughout this semester we've been talking about those areas in which the law or regulation don't apply, but in which we still can take a course of action that can be dis determined to be right or wrong. So ethics is at play secondarily for professionals and public servants to what is required legally or by regulation. So once we've ascertained that there are no legal or regulatory prescriptions which apply, the second step is to assess which of the four ethical principles are relevant to the situation, and more than likely you'll find that more than one is. Third, assess whether any institutional, agency, or professional guidelines, past practices, and previous interpretations bear on the situation. Those can provide guidance too, and that's where the professional's experience comes into play and their practical wisdom. Fourth, consider whether this situation is sufficiently similar to previous situations such that we can make the same determination or whether there's a relevant difference. Fifth, if the principles conflict, given your assessment of the situation, then you have to consider whether compromise is possible or whether um, we have to establish some sort of relative priority of the principles to solve the situation and move forward with some course of action that is ethically defensible. Six, consider how to minimize the violation of other principles even after the dilemma is solved. And always, always, always act according to your best professional judgment. All right, wrapping up. Thinking ethically means thinking through problems from within a framework of ethical principles. The four principles we've been learning about in this semester can be used either in the form of a practical syllogism, which is a, a highly structured uh, and logically based argument that leads to a conclusion, or through an exercise of practical wisdom, which allows more flexibility, directs us toward interpretation, compromise, and prioritization. The professional is able to use her judgment to relate the relevant facts of the situation to the relevant ethical principles in order to address the problem through the following set of strategies. First, interpreting the principles to allow the best resolution of an otherwise seemingly intractable dilemma. Second, finding a suitable compromise if interpretation doesn't resolve the dilemma. And it's a compromise in which as many of the conflicting principles as possible are satisfied. If that also provides no guidance on how um, to move forward, then uh, the professional prioritizes relevant principles according to the details of the situation. This requires viewing ethical principles not as absolute, but as prima facie. And the prioritization is always temporary and only temporarily suspends those lower prioritized principles. It does not nullify them, the obligation that those lower principles still uh, bear still must be addressed after the dilemma is resolved. All right, here are some questions to think about. And if you can work your way through these questions, then you're ready for the next section. Thank you very much.